This is Rosemary Access Board. The time now is 1 p.m. And I do have interpreters ready, captioning is ready, staff is ready. And I do have Chairman Taryn Williams and Vice Chair Greg Fairbeck. Sachin, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the July 13th, 2022 Access Board meeting of the full board. My name is Taryn Williams, and I now call this meeting to order. And let me just say I'm thrilled to welcome participants both in person and virtually to our July meeting and look, and look forward to our agenda today. Rose Marie will now call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin with uh, Mr. Elver Arisa Silva. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Elver Arisa Silva, public member, Washington, D.C. HHS, Allison Barkoff. Hi, this is Brian. Allison will be joining us at 1.30. Okay, great. Thank you. Karen Breitmeyer. Uh, this is Karen Breitmeyer, uh, present. Department of Defense, Gilbert Cisneros. A Department of Justice, Kristen Clark. Christina Galindo Walsh for AAG Clark, uh, proxy to the chair. Department of Transportation, Christopher Coase. Uh, good afternoon, Christopher Coase, um, DOG. Glad to be here. Thank you. Heather Dowdy. <laughs> Good afternoon, Heather Dowdy, public member joining from Charlotte, North Carolina. Gregory Fairback. Greg Fairback, public member, Indiana. Amy Hamrawi. Hi everyone, Amy Hamrawi, Nashville, Tennessee, public member. Hannah Ibanez. Hello, everyone. Hannah Ibanez, present in person in D.C. General Services Administration, Katie Kale. Michael Fogel, representing proxy to the chair. Alexis Andrakashar. Good afternoon. This is Alexis Kashar, present public member from New York. U.S. Postal Service, Benjamin Kuo. Yes, good afternoon, Ben Kuo from Postal Service, present. Thank you. K.R. Liu. Good afternoon, everyone. K.R. Liu, public member, Bellevue, Washington. Mr. Benjamin Nadalski. This is Benjamin Adolski, present here in DC from Tennessee. Department of Education, Katie Knees. This is Tanya Steller, attending for Katie Knees, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. Thank you. Veterans Affairs, Michael Parrish. Uh, Victor Pineda. President, public member from California. Madeline Rose Ruvillo. Hello, Madeline Ruvillo, public member joining from Oakland, California. Deb Ryan. Hi, Debbie Ryan from Boston, public member. Karen Tamley. Karen Tamley, public member from Chicago here in Washington, present. Department of Labor, Taryn Williams. Good afternoon. This is Taryn Williams here in the room today, present. Housing and Urban Development, uh, Janine Warden. 
This is Rex Pace, uh, agency liaison, present here in DC. Okay. Department of Commerce, Jeremy Pelter. And do I have anyone from Department of the Interior? All right, did I forget anybody? Hi, this is Allison Barkoff from the Department of Health and Human Services. Apologies for being a couple minutes late. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Great, thank you. Uh, we will now move to approval of the draft May 11, 2022 meeting minutes. I now call for a motion to approve the May 11, 2022 draft meeting minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh. Any opposed? Any abstained? I believe the motion passed. It sounds like the room is muted. Sorry. Can you hear? Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right as she was doing the the um, the motion passes, then she went quiet. So that's when we lost her. So. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Scott. I'll start over again. Um, this is Sachin Pavitram, the Executive Director of the U.S. Access Board. Uh, this is the first time the board has met in person in D.C. Uh, since the pandemic started, so it's great to see the board members here in our office space. Uh, this was the, also the first time we have tried a hybrid version of our board meeting, so it's we're still a learning process, but we're looking forward to the opportunities this new technology has given us and see what we can do to learn more about making a more inclusive and accessible meeting space uh, for future board meetings. Just to start off, I want to uh, introduce a new staff member that joined us about a month, little or a month ago. Her name is Alison Levy. She joined us from Department of Transportation to take in the position as the Director of Office of Technical and Information Services. Uh, Allison has been part of the federal service for, for quite some time now. She has served in DOT in, uh, in agriculture, but she also has worked in the disability space for quite some time. So is well respected and well known in the, in the, not only just in the federal space, but also outside the federal space for the work she has done to contribute for in inclusion and accessibility, uh, both for federal employees and others who benefit from uh, the, the good access. So we welcome uh, Allison to our team and looking forward to working with her for years to come. I want to talk briefly about our rulemaking that is in process right now, just give a quick update of the various rulemaking that is uh, that we are working on within the agency. Uh, public rights of way, accessibility guidelines, PROAG in short. Uh, we have been working pretty closely with our agency partners, Department of Justice and Department of Transportation. We are close to finalizing our rule text. We want to make sure our, our colleagues in, in the justice, in justice and in transportation, we're all on the same page before the rule is pushed forward for a full board vote. We did hear from... Uh, we did present uh, some of the uh, 
some of the activities that's been having in this committee, and you'll hear from that shortly uh, from our uh, from the PROVAC committee uh, down the agenda. The medical diagnostic equipment rulemaking, we had an informational meeting uh, or information gathering meeting in May where we were able to get great feedback from both industry and uh, the uh, public in general, advocates, uh, people with disabilities, which will inform us in finalizing this rule. Staff is currently working in fi uh, finalizing uh, this rule and hopeful to uh, get it wrapped up uh, towards the end of this year or early next year. Self-service transaction machines is, uh, is the other rule that we have just started. Uh, the board approved to send the uh, the AMPRM announcement for notice for, pub, uh, for proposed rulemaking. This has been sent to OMB for their review. We are, we are waiting for OMB to finish their process before it is filed in the Federal Register. That is one rule that will which you'll be hearing a lot from because that's uh, something that we had just barely started and we will be working on the scoping and other parts of that particular rule and uh, there'll be more information coming forward as the process goes along. The Architectural Barriers Act enforcement, that is uh, the one enforcement authority that we have. I just want to share some of the inf information activities we've had since the last board meeting. S since April 20th to now, we have received, we have received 52 uh, complaints. And we have closed 37 complaints out of the 52 received. Out of out of the 32 that was closed, nine of them were closed after corrective actions. I just want to remind members of the public, if anyone comes across any federal space that has any accessibility barrier, please do go to our website where you can file a complaint and the access board will staff will be looking through the complaints that's received so that we can ensure any uh, barriers that ex exist in federal spaces is removed. So please visit our website if there are federal spaces that you notice has any kind of accessibility barriers. One of the activities that happened that you'll hear more about uh, later on is an establishment of the outreach, outreach committee for the Access Board. Over the last year and a half, staff has been working on how to best reach out to communities that we haven't engaged in the past, uh, whether it's uh, people, underserved communities uh, and uh, tribal nations. We uh, formed this committee to make sure that we are able to take, take our message and information to all those who haven't heard about the Access Board in the past. For, and I do encourage members of the public uh, to share the information that we share from the access board with your communities and other communities that you work with. Technical assistance is uh, one of the focus areas we have at the access board since the since the beginning of this fiscal year, we have received over 3000 unique technical assistance requests inquiries and the access board staff continues to provide those uh, assistance as needed. You can reach the access board for any uh, inquiries you might have, any technical assistance that you need via our 800 number or email, and uh, one of our staff will get back to you with any uh, TA request that you might have. We are also finalizing, we have finalized our signed guides, which will be published on our website uh, shortly as well. Just a reminder, we do have six of our guides published on our website. These are the, uh, the first six uh, chapters of the ADA and ABA. So please do uh, take a look at that in our, on our website and do share with your colleagues who might find that useful. The sign, the sign guide should be coming shortly as well. One of the areas that we've been working on in the last couple of months since the passage of the infrastructure bill, 
we've been working closely with the Department of Transportation to issue a technical information a document on electric vehicle charging stations. Since the, le the legislation that was passed, there is uh, about $5 billion in new charging stations for about 500,000 charging stations to, to come into existence in the, in the next uh, several years to come. We want to make sure we're ahead of the game. Since the rulemaking process does take some time, we took the step to issue this technical information document so that uh, in the industry and others working on in, in the installation of this uh, EV charging stations have a guide or a document to refer to to ensure those EV charging stations are accessible. Since the pandemic, uh, we have now started offering our trainings in person as well. We've been very successful in offering virtual trainings. That portion is going to continue. We are uh, getting a lot of requests for in-person training as well. Staff has been very busy in providing these tra trainings. Since, since the beginning of the fiscal year, we have provided about 68 trainings and reached over 16,000 uh, audiences uh, in our trainings thus far, which is, uh, which is a larger number than we have uh, re uh, reached in the past. So if you have any requests for tr uh, trainings from our staff, please do re uh, reach out to us. We've been busy also offering a lot of trainings for our federal partners uh, as well to uh, ensure they have the information when it comes to accessibility. One of the committees that has not been active uh, in the last couple of board meetings is the Elections Assistance Commission. We, uh, since the since the appointment of new board members, we were in the process of uh, appointing new board members onto this uh, these slots that the Access Board have for the EAC. Uh, the Access Board has two. Uh, uh, two slots available for the Board of Advisors for the Elections Ass Assistance Commission and a, and the Technical Guidelines Development Committee. Hannah Ibanez and Benjamin Nadowski are the two public members appointed to this uh, to these uh, committees. They have they will be representing the Access Board to both. Uh, both the Board of Advisors of the EAC and the TGDC Committee Committee of the EAC. Uh, there will be more information coming forward about uh, their work with the EAC uh, as soon as uh, the next meetings of the EAC uh, starts. The last item I, I have on my report is a request that we received from the GAO the government accounting office. So the, the GAO has initiated a study of the access board to get a better understanding of the partnership and the collaboration we have with the various federal partners and other entities that the access board works with. Uh, we got this inquiry in May and we met with the GAO staff uh, during May for the first entrance uh, meeting that they conducted, soon after which the Access Board has provided all the documentation that the GAO has requested for us. During this process, we believe uh, federal agencies, uh, federal partners, uh, public members, and others may be contacted uh, by GAO just to get a better understanding of the workings of the Access Board and also to understand the different collaborative work that we do with the, uh, you know, with our federal partners. Uh, just, uh, just as an FYI, this uh, GAO study was initiated by uh, Senator Patty Murray and uh, Senator Duckworth. This is a this is a process that most federal agencies do go through. I, if there's any questions for board members, happy to answer about that uh, topic as well. But uh, right now, we are just waiting for the GAO to uh, get back to us after reviewing all the documents, necessary documents that we have shared with um, uh, with with the staff at GAO. 
with that, M Madam Chair, that's that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions about the GAO study or any other topics I addressed. This is Taryn. Are there any questions? Okay. We will now move forward with the standing committee reports. Uh, we'll start with the technical programs committee. Deb Ryan, vice chair, Bill Botton, staff liaison. Thank you, Madam Chair. On Monday, the technical programs committee met um, and received the third quarter FY 2022 updates on the technical assistance and training programs. Staff continues to provide technical technical assistance on both the built environment and the Section 508 standards. The inquiries staff receive are both phone and email based, with email being the predominant source. Additional information on technical assistance inquiries is provided in the board meeting packet. Additionally, staff continue to provide in-person and virtual trainings and webinars. Information about hosting and accessibility training for your organization and a calendar of upcoming board-sponsored webinars is available on the Access Board website, or feel free to reach out to the staff. Finally, the Technical Programs Committee will be developing a research agenda, uh, kind of like a wish list for the board, and will present uh, committee recommendations at an upcoming board meeting. Are there any questions? If not, that concludes the Technical Programs Committee. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will now move forward with a, an update on planning and evaluation. Karen Tamley, Chair, Francis Spiegel, Staff Liaison. Great, thank you. Uh, the Planning and Evaluation Committee met yesterday to review the itinerary for the board's out-of-town trip to Philadelphia, um, which will take place September 13th through the 15th um, of this year. The board scheduled to meet with the National Park Service to learn more about the accessibility of Independence National Historic Park. In addition, the board will be meeting with the Philadelphia Parks, of, Parks and Recreation Department regarding the accessibility of recreational facilities in Philadelphia and with the Inglis Innovation Center to look at how they've gone above and beyond federal accessibility standards to make their facilities even more accessible to persons with disabilities. The board will also be experiencing demonstrations of emerging wearable accessible technologies for the performing arts and hearing about design considerations for neurodivergent individuals. In addition to our site visits, the Access Board will hold public trainings and a town hall. The Access Board will hold six public trainings throughout the week. With respect to the built environment, on Tuesday, September 13th at Temple University, the board will be offering a training on architectural design and social justice, which will be presented by a board member and architect, Karen Breitmeyer. We especially encourage students of architecture and design to attend this training. We'll also be offering an overview of the ADA and ABA accessibility standards. On Wednesday, September 14th at Liberty Resources, which is the Center for Independent Living, um, we're going to be holding a training on the accessibility of historic buildings and facilities. Continuing education credits are available for all of these trainings. On the digital accessibility side, on Tuesday, September 13th at Temple University, we'll be holding a training on the requirements for digital accessibility in higher education in collaboration with our partners at the Department of Education and a hands-on training on how to make digital documents accessible. <clears throat> On Wednesday, at the offices of Sierra Taman, we'll be holding an advanced question and answer session on the 508 standards and um, WCAG requirements, as well as another hands-on training on making digital documents accessible. The town hall event will be held on Wednesday, September 14th at Liberty Resources. Again, the Center for Independent Living in Philadelphia. So the board can hear from local residents about how they experience accessibility in Philadelphia. Registration will be required 
for all trainings as well as for the town hall as they are in person and space is limited. Information on how to register will be available soon on the Access Board's web website. <clears throat> I'd like to conclude by um, just acknowledging the assistance of the many individuals and the local organizations in Philadelphia and the other partners who helped make um, this event happen. It takes a lot to put together an out-of-town um, event. Um, so I'd like to thank Amy Navis, who's the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Mayor's Office on Disability, Tom Earle, the CEO of Liberty Resources, Roger Odeshi of GW University, John Orr of ArtReach, Vicki Landers of Disability Pride, PA, Chuck Horton of Inglis Innovation Center, Bill Salvador and Patrick Morgan at Philadelphia Parks and Rec, Temple University Institute on Disabilities, Sierra Taman co co Collaboration, Anna Pung of ACL, Paul Campbell of the National Park Service, the National Digital Access Team at the Department of Education, and the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. <clears throat> we really greatly appreciate um, all of these organizations and individuals. Um, I apologize for any names I may have missed, um, but again, thank you for taking the time to make this out-of-town visit um, possible. And we're really looking forward to the trip and the opportunity to better understand accessibility in Philadelphia. Um, finally, the committee reviewed the dates of our 2023 board meetings, and those dates will soon be posted on the Access Board website. So um, are there any questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. We'll now hear from the Budget Committee, Karen Breitmeyer, Chair, Jeff Sargent, Staff Liaison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Budget Committee met on Monday morning. Uh, we discussed first the fiscal 2022 uh, budget. Uh, as of June 21st, Access Board overall spending was within budget, um, just under 64% of funds expended with 72% of the fiscal year expired. Uh, we will be moving forward in the fourth quarter with obligating funds for some of our larger contracts and inter interagency agreements, most notably IT support and administrative support. We also intend to execute an agreement with the Volpe Center for a regulatory impact uh, analysis. In the space management category, we are expecting no further expenditures this fiscal year due to a rebate on our rent for the first year of our lease, which began January 1st. Some of these funds will be redirected to the administrative support category to cover a requirement to digitize our paper records by the end of the fiscal year. Now, looking at fiscal year 2023, on June 30th, the House Transportation HUD Appropriations Subcommittee passed H.R. 8294, which included $9.85 million for the Access Board for fiscal year 2023. The bill now moves to the House Appropriations Committee and then to the full House. No action to date has been taken by the Senate. And that concludes my report. So I hand it back to you. Thank you for that update. And we'll now move to an update on frontier issues. Alexis Kishore, Chair, Tim Cregan, Staff Liaison. Thank you, Chair. At Tuesday's meeting of the Access Board, the Committee on Frontier Issues, we received a presentation from Sandy Hannabrink. Sandy's the Executive Director of an organization called Touch the Future, which focuses on assistive technologies and products and services. Sandy presented us with information and shared her personal experiences with using the Phoenix Suit X exoskeleton. 
It is a wearable design that helps people with mobility disorders to stand up right and to be mobile. Sandy shared her experiences with that device through videos and walked us through the National Park and showed us how the device fits on her body and fits her particular needs. If you'd like further information on the Phoenix suit, we will post the web address and the web, web link for Phoenix X will come up. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Chair. Now move forward with the ad hoc committee reports. Uh, we'll start with a report on design guidance from Karen Brittmeyer, Chair, Scott Winley, Staff Liaison. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Design Guidance Ad Hoc Committee met on Tuesday morning. Um, the Design Guide team presented the EV Charging Station Technical Assistance Document that's under development. Uh, Randall uh, led the committee through a full review of the document. Staff intends to have this document up on our website very soon to assist those that are applying for grants from the Department of Transportation's National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, known as NEVI, N-E-V-I. And um, that's it for my report. Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll now move on to a report from Public Rights of Way. Uh, Karen Tamley Chair, Juliet Schultz, Staff Liaison. Julie, can I turn it to you? I don't know if I, I can know. report it. Can you report? Thank you. Um, this is Frances Spiegel on behalf of the committee. Um, the, the Public Rights of White Committee met yesterday. Staff gave an overview of um, the status of the rulemaking and um, provided a review of the um, content of the rule to the board. And um, the board looks forward to publishing that rule later this year. Thank you, Francis. Uh, we'll now move on to an update from the Outreach Special Committee, KR Lu Chair, Philip Brata, Staff Liaison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, I'm Public Member KR Lu, Chair of the newly established Special Committee on Outreach. This special committee was created by Madam Chair Williams on June 22nd for the purpose of developing an outreach plan for the agency. At today's first meeting, the committee voted to approve the committee's charter. We then heard from staff about recent outreach efforts by the board that align with the board's fiscal year 2022-2026 strategic plan and several executive orders issued by the current administration. The committee brainstormed ideas and strategies on future outreach activities and content to consider for the outreach plan. The committee expects to meet prior to the November board meeting to discuss next steps in moving forward with the outreach plan. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you for that update. We'll now move forward with our federal agency updates. We'll open the floor to federal members and liaisons to present uh, any announcements or information from their agencies. I'll start by asking those uh, members or liaisons in the room uh, to indicate if they want to provide announcements first. Rex? Yes, this is Rex Pace with the Department, uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I just want to alert everyone that uh, we will start a series of trainings on the accessibility design requirements of the Fair Housing Act. We have a website. It's called uh, 
Fair, House first, Fair Housing Accessibility First, please go to that website and we're offering a series of virtual trainings there for free. Um, so you might be interested in that. Check it out. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Michael Fogel, GSA. Um, at, at our last uh, meeting, the um, board member, Katie Kale, she had several issues. There are items that she brought up, and I just wanted to go ahead and update you on these these elements. So these items, one of the items where, where, where they issued, GSA issued an RFI to the design and construction industries to survey the current state of DEI practices. The results of the survey are currently being analyzed and developed into a report that will be issued in partnership with Dodge Data and Analytics. We target August, September 2022. Another bullet point, uh, they, we scheduled an up, a upcoming public services, our building, public building services customer forum in June, which will which will have content focused on DEIA and how federal agencies can be deliberate in requesting accessibility features beyond simply compliance with the design, with the design process with GSA. <clears throat> Follow up the forum on DEIA practices and universal design in the built environment featured a virtual panel discussion with GSA's acting chief architect, industry representatives with HOK and McK McKissick and GSA senior advisor to the administrator for equity for, for equity. With over 100 virtual attendees from GSA customer agencies, the panelists discussed ways to advance inclusive design practices, invest in accessibility beyond compliance standards, and improve AE construction supplier diversity. <clears throat> Last bullet point, we're uh, GSA and the Persons with Disability Special Emphasis Program. GSA reestablished in fall of 2021 with executive sponsorship, GSA's PWD SEP, Persons with Disabilities Special Emphasis Program, and uh, is a very active is very active with agency wide programming, including recent uh, re recent events featuring guest speakers <clears throat> from the Department of Labor's National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. The N I N-I-D-I-L-R-R, and I believe we had some presentations with this group before, so they're, they're very important to us here at GSA. The PWD SEP is also helping to advise GSA leadership on efforts to centralize agency funding and program support with a ASL interpreters, reasonable accommodation, and CART services. I also presented a uh, to to the board to this program GSA's. Um, now, uh, their uh, policy and action plan regarding hybrid work environments, fully remote work, and also in-person work, uh, in person work environments, and how GSA strategic plan is moving forward <clears throat> to integrate all of these elements into a cohesive work plan. So those would be the updates to our last one, or to, to, to the la last elements that we talked about. And I also wanted to talk about a, um, a GSA success story, if I can, for for a couple of minutes, if that's all right. We um, GSA we the, we manage millions and millions of square feet of federal office space, federal courtroom spaces throughout the United States, and um, one of the things uh, and. There are several uh, hundreds of agencies who are going into these office spaces, including the courts and, you know, and um, Social Security, DHS. And, <clears throat> and the thing is, with our federal buildings, we're, we're starting to see a lot of them starting to age. But and at the same time, um, when GSA's policy is to try to move, start moving people out of lease spaces back into the federal building spaces, and in doing that, we're starting. To, we're looking at older buildings who are not compliant with accessibility standards, and bring and try. And what we we need to do to bring these buildings up to their current uh, to current accessibility codes. Well, in a, a building in San Diego, one of our U.S. Uh, federal courthouses. We found that uh, on four floors of a very large federal courthouse in San Diego, that there were um, the the accessible bathrooms for these courthouses or for these court 
rooms were on the first floor as opposed to the floors where the courts were. And we received several um, uh, concerns and complaints with the local veterans, uh, veteran disabled uh, access, veteran disabled attorneys association, and and some of their representatives, and also from the of the of the U.S. Uh, U.S. Senator Diane Feinstein's office, asking if we could look at ways to better help the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, these mobility disabled people get to bathrooms during the breaks uh, in, their, in the court proceedings. Because what they would have to do is go out, the, out into the hallway, get on, out, get on an elevator, go down to the first floor, use the, use the, use the accessible bathrooms there, and then come back up. And at, at times it was, um, by, that, by the time they got back, the proceedings had already started, and so they're interrupting these, uh, these, these federal court proceedings. So we... Uh, Knowing we had uh, the, the way GSA kind of works, we we were pr very methodical. We 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 provide a report. We get a uh, architect engineers to provide us a report. Then we get that report. We turn that into a construction document, and then we, and the construction document goes out to to contractors, and the contractors build it, and that takes about two years or so. And um, but with the emphasis on trying to do some interim solution here. We uh, we talk, um, we were asked, uh, and, I, I, and I was um, um, trying very hard to try to find a solution that could happen now within a month or two, so that we could alleviate this, the problems, and then at, uh, then take that interim solution and turn it into a final solution, which would be the um, which would be the the reconstruction. And so we worked very closely with. Uh, G GSA building management with their service center, with their portfolio people, with uh, their contract uh, operations and maintenance people. They're, literally, there's 20, 30 people on a call to find a way to provide an interim solution to accommodate the the, uh, the the issues that we have at hand. And within a week, we had a solution. We had it. We had it turned around so that we what we did was we took some of the uh, some of the bathrooms in the on the floors and we removed one of the one of the water closets and which opened up the the uh, and took down a couple of partitions so we would have an interim accessible water closet where, where you could get in with with the turning circles and the turning uh, radiuses we we took off doors we opened up walls so that we could get into these bathrooms and and, and that was all done internal to gsa our proactive approach internal to GSA, so that it took some of the pressure off us, so that the, so that we could go ahead and get the get the reports from the architect engineers and do and then finally do the uh, the the, per, the final the permanent solution, and so now we're the uh, we we uh, received nothing but kudos and um, nice warm regards to from uh, uh, the senator's office to to us for getting this interim solution in place and then also. Following up with a with a, a permanent solution, which right now is in in design and should be constructed in, in 2023. So again, I consider that a, a success story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Other updates from federal members in the room. Go ahead. I, I apologize to the chair. I forgot to mention something in regard to the training. The access board was nice enough to uh, post a description on, under the news, on the news web page, which will give you a link to register for people who are interested in that. So we just, I just appreciate the access board promoting this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll deliver one update on behalf of the Department of Labor. Uh, recently, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP, has been working on policy related to addressing digital equity and its impact on employment for people with disabilities. This is in light of uh, the role that reliable high-speed internet uh, plays in helping individuals to access education and training, applying for jobs, and participating in hybrid and in-person work. Uh, researchers from ODEP have found that among workers with disabilities, home internet access um, and a job that includes internet uh, 
a use strongly increase the probability of keeping their job during the COVID-19 pandemic by 20 percent. Uh, however, our researchers also found that people with disabilities, especially low income and people of color with disabilities, continue to have lower rates of access to home internet, home computers, and telework eligible jobs. Uh, these findings and the uh, related policy recommendations uh, can be found in a report that is available online. It's titled Disability and the Digital Divide, Internet Subscriptions, Internet Use, and Employment Outcomes. Uh, that can be found on our website, and uh, we will continue with policy work related uh, to this area because Recently, the administration launched a new Internet for All initiative to bring high-speed broadband to all Americans, and we're committed to ensuring that people with disabilities are included in those efforts. Thank you. We'll now move on to federal updates from our uh, virtual participants. Uh, we'll start with Allison from ACL HHS. Hi, thank you uh, so much, Taryn, and I'm sorry I'm not able to be in the room with you today. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple collaborations. Um, first, I really wanted to thank Sachin and the Access Board for uh, hosting us together um, with the German delegation to talk about some of our agency's shared priorities with a real focus on accessibility. Um, so thank you again, uh, Sachin and Rosemary and, and others for that opportunity. Um, wanted to share with the full board that um, our National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLER, um, whom I believe we presented a couple meetings ago, are um, working closely with the Access Board and just earlier this month identified a couple key grants that we're likely to be um, awarding this year that really closely align with the board's current priorities. Um, and then finally, as folks will see in the unified agenda, um, HHS is working on updating our Section 504 regulations for the first time in more than 40 years. Um, and uh, included on that list is adopting standards on medical diagnostic equipment, um, something that the Access Board has played such a pivotal role in. And um, really want to thank all of you for your work on that, as well as um, thanking the Access Board for being a resource to us as we are um, thinking and working on our notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, so those are our, our updates. And again, thanks to Sachin and the whole board for your partnership. Great, thank you. Additional updates from federal members? Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to new business. I open the floor to members of the board for any new business that they would like to raise for discussion or action for an upcoming meeting. Okay, and if there are no further items to report, I would like to announce that the next meeting of the full board uh, will be held virtually on Zoom. Uh, details will be announced, and that will be Monday through Wednesday, November 7th through 9th, 2022. I will now ask uh, for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. And thank you to our interpreters, Glashanda and Jackie, and I'm missing the other one. Uh, 
Danita, is that it? And Captioner Jen, thank you very much for coming in today. The Access Board meeting for July 2022 is officially adjourned. This is Scott. I just wanted to say ha have a safe trip, everybody.